others like her. Um, most of us have been involved in this work for a long, long time. Some of us teaching about the new dangers of the internet to children. Some are examining the creep of violent pornography from the fringes of our social fabric to the center of our social fabric. Some of us are studying the national and foreign national law addressing, um, sorry, I've got to get my, I've got to figure out whether I should wear my glasses or not, addressing the buying and selling of human beings, including young children, for purposes of sexual exploitation. Yet all of us know that although we're working on a single issue, they're all of the same cloth. They're all forms of commercial sexual exploitation of women and children, a lucrative industry that benefits some and badly hurts many, many others. So for too long, our, our work has been stovepiped. One organization focusing on sex trafficking, another is on sex tourism, one on child pornography, another on child abduction, another on adult pornography. If our challenge at the end of the 20th century was to recognize that um, sexual exploitation is a growing phenomenon, the crime of choice for international criminal enterprises, our challenge in the 21st century is to link up all of our various efforts. We must do it. We have to make the connections between the various forms of sexual explo exploitation, sex trafficking, and sex slavery. And we have to organize across the barriers. Why do we have to do this? We need to do this because the traffickers and the exploiters are already organized. They are organized across language barriers, across ethnic and cultural differences, across national and geographic boundaries, and more. On the internet, they've learned how to use new technologies to transmit sexually exploited images. They've perfected techniques for stalking online. They've created special sex-oriented chat rooms and special global sex clubs. They've encrypted and encoded their activities to make it more difficult for our law enforcement to find them. They form professional associations and legitimate fronts, even legitimate in, in, in NGOs to help uh, protect their interests from uh, and, and formulate new strategies for the future. On the streets, they've perfected methods for identifying and recruiting the most vulnerable, as many of us have said today. Um, and they've developed domestic pimping circuits that move juveniles across state and county lines and located and cultivated a clientele to, to uh, sell to. And in so doing, they have grown rich, rich and powerful beyond belief. And so this is what we're confronted with right now. Globally, they understood long before we did that sex tourism is just the opposite side of the coin of sex trafficking. In the latter, you transport the women and children to where you want the, to the buyer. In the former, you transport the buyer to the women and children. And they've identified whole countries, usually resource poor, where the most heinous crimes can be committed without with hardly a blink of an eye, with anybody blinking an eye. And they've identified other countries, usually resource rich, where men will spend money to travel to commit unspeakable acts. Um, if they think they can get away with it. And the amount of money, again, that passes hands over the internet, our streets, globally, across international borders in these criminal enterprises, is, it's, it's estimated conservatively at somewhere about 50 billion, but I know it's much, much more than that if we would put all these industries together and, and get a cumulative number, which we've never had. Um, so this panel was about <laughs> Drive pornography as a driver of demand for prostitution and sex trafficking. And when, when, when I talk to women like Shelley, who have been victims of commercial sexual exploitation and sex trafficking, they always tell me that we will never have success in eradicating sex trafficking unless and until we tackle the cultural messages of pornography and related materials that are encouraging this exploitation and abuse. These messages are aimed early at men and boys telling them over and over again, it's okay, indeed, it's natural and normal to use and exploit females. And they're aimed at young women and girls to say it's glamorous, sexy, and chic to be used, abused, and exploited. Now, 30 years ago, Robin Morgan said, pornography is the theory and rape is the practice. But as I've worked on this over the years, I've realized she only had it half right. In reality, pornography is the theory and sale of sex and sexuality is the practice. In fact, pornography is a brilliant social marketing campaign for commercial sexual exploitation. Mm. 
Social marketing began as a formal discipline in 1971, and I owe Judith Reisman again um, uh, for this. Um, uh, this was in an early interview that I did with you 30 years ago. Um, uh, uh, with the publication of a book called Social Marketing, an Approach to the Planned Social Change in the Journal of Marketing by marketing experts Philip Kotler and Gerald Zolman. And speaking about social marketing and social marketing campaigns, Kotler wrote, it's an organized effort conducted by one group, the change agent, which attempts to persuade others, the target adopters, to accept, modify, or abandon certain ideas, attitudes, and practices. And early on, pornographers got this, and they consulted Kotler and many others, Yanklovich and others, in an attempt to design comprehensive efforts to change young men and boys, and to move them away from sexuality as a part of love, intimacy, marriage, family, healthy relationships, and toward the purchase of sex. And these life and lifestyles were necessary, changes were necessary if their businesses were to flourish. In other words, commercializing of sex and its twin, the exploitation of sex, were necessary in order to keep men buying these magazines. One feminist calls it the prostitution of sexuality, a phrase that makes clear the commodification not just of women's bodies, but of sex and sexuality itself. And um, this is another thing that feminists had wrong. It's not just women who are hurt. All of us are hurt. Men, women, children, our families were all hurt. So the exploiters have perfected their social marketing techniques and we've got to reverse engineer. We've got to create our own social marketing campaigns. We've done it before in other industries that were destroying lives. We figured this out so we can figure it out in this one. I think cigarette smoking is a perfect example. We had 40 or 50 years of cigarette smoking where it was cool and you know, it was um, considered just a, a normal part of what we did. Every movie star smoked, and, and uh, you, could, you could find you know, everyone smoked. But as soon as we found out that it was harmful, and we had about 20 years of studies that were funded by the government to prove the harm of smoking, then the government, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in conjunction with NIH and CDC and other health agencies, funded a series of studies to look at the efforts to reduce uh, cigarette smoking. What would, what would help? They noticed that tobacco use usually begins during adolescence in young adulthood, and they agreed that preventing smoking initiation among youth and young people was critical to reducing the tobacco smoking in the, in the U.S. And so then they helped to design campaigns that would target young people and efforts to reduce cigarette smoking including, included providing effective smoking cessation interventions and guidance to tailoring youth and adults in, in, in schools, work, and community settings, conducting uh, counter-marketing campaigns to help young people reject the constant 24-7 message about the, the coolness of cigarette smoking, um, reducing access to minor, to, of minors to, to uh, tobacco products, and monitoring smoking trends among youth and young people and young adults. Now, if we just take the phrase commercial sexual exploitation and substitute that for cigarette smoking, we have a campaign. We have a way forward to address this. This is our reverse engineering, and we need to do it. And our very best advisors in this process are going to be people like Shelley and the, all the members of the Pink Cross Foundation and other survivors. Survivors have a great deal to offer in the realm of the anti-trafficking work because they are the ones who have the real life experience of the hell of this industry. They have a knowledge and an expertise that can't be gained in any textbook or from any course of training. So we need to make our programs more survivor-centered, not out of pity for a survivor, but because every aspect of our programs, whether they're prevention or prosecution or protection, will be strengthened and ultimately more successful if we incorporate them. So I'm looking forward to figuring out the ways to work together to make this new social marketing campaign and this move forward happen. We've made some progress, we can see, from all the work that we've all done, but there's so much more to do. 
Two centuries ago, U.S. citizens organized an abolitionist movement to eradicate African chattel slavery, and today we are building another critical mass of people to abolish these new forms of contemporary slavery. We've got to learn to coordinate and collaborate. I love the clapping where we got ourselves together and to work toward a common goal, and if we do, we will surely succeed. Thank you very much.